tried my best to be a good Catholic for like a week. And then I just, it just didn't resonate with me. It didn't make any sense. And I was that one that would ask questions like, um, uh, if, you know, why did Jesus at the cross say, why have you forsaken me? And I remember them coming through the catechism classes and asking what boys wanted to be altar boys. And I raised my hand and they said, you can't do that because you're not a boy. And I said, I don't understand why I have to have a penis to hold a plate under someone's mouth during communion. <laughs> and they didn't like that question or that answer. So uh, I was constantly in trouble with the nuns, but I was, I was kind of an upstart. So um, kind of forced into Catholicism, questioned it the entire way. Mm -hmm. And when my mother passed away when I was 18, there also left my experience with the Catholic Church. <music>this is Dale Cross and welcome to another episode of Soul Inspire. This is the audio video podcast that features spiritually awakening souls sharing uplifting stories to help inspire you on your own unique soul journey. On this episode, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Dr. Kathy Groover. Dr. Kathy Groover is an award-winning author professional speaker and ACC certified coach with over 30 years of experience in mind, body, medicine, and human behavior, an entertainer and educator imbuing all her programs with practicality and passion with a West coast mentality and an East coast delivery. I like that. Her humorous down to earth and engaging style has captivated hundreds of audiences on four continents, three cruise ships, and a handful of islands. It's been her true honor to have delivered two TEDx talks. Now, Kathy has written eight books, which have garnered 12 awards, hosted a TV series based on her first book, developed a stress reduction program for the US military and co-hosts the Fire and Earth podcast. She has penned countless articles and appears regularly as a guest on radio, TV, and in print media. And she recently appeared on the Dr. Phil show. She has earned her PhD in natural health and has studied mind body medicine at the famed Benson Henry Institute for mind body medicine at Harvard. Kathy currently lives in Santa Barbara, California with her life partner, Eric and her wonderful cat, Alistair. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, well, the pleasure is all ours. And I interviewed you many years ago when I was hosting a radio show on LA Talk Radio. So I remembered you nice. as one of the guests that I really enjoyed. And I was like, okay, I got to get her back on. I got to get her on my new show. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, well, good. I'm happy to be back. So that's wonderful. So let's, uh, let's just go. Let's just um, start off with because this program is dedicated to, you know, folks sharing their, their stories of spiritual awakening. So I'd like you to go back to your childhood, if you will, and tell me, was there any kind of spiritual background or religious background or anything like that when you grew up and how did that influence you going forward? Start out there. Yeah. So I grew up in Pittsburgh and I'm an only child. So uh, I had to live both my mom's dream and my dad's dream, right? And uh, my mother was very Catholic, very proper, uh, went to Catholic school, uh, all girls Catholic school, which would have been a nightmare for me. And so my dad was nothing. He was raised sort of like Presbyterian or like Catholic light, but didn't grow up in a household that went to church, didn't grow up in an environment that, that pushed religion or a belief system. And so my mom's requirement was I be Catholic. And he kind of gave into that and went, okay, but don't expect me to go. <laughs> so okay. on Fridays during Lent, like we McDonald's was our, our treat every like so many Fridays. And during Lent, he'd sit there with his Big Mac going, mm, and I'd be stuck with the filet of fish sandwich because, you know, we're not supposed to eat meat on Fridays. <laughs> and every Saturday night, not Sunday morning, but Saturday night, I was forced very much under duress to go to church. <laughs> and um, I went to catechism classes because luckily my father won out on that and didn't send me to an all girls Catholic school, which I don't know that we'd be sitting here having this conversation because I don't know that I would have survived it. Oh. Um, I, I tried my best to be a good Catholic for like a week. And then I just, it just didn't resonate with me. It didn't make any sense. And I was that one that would ask questions like, 
Um, uh, if, you know, why did Jesus of the cross say, why have you forsaken me? And I remember them coming through the catechism classes and asking what boys wanted to be altar boys. And I raised my hand and they said, you can't do that because you're not a boy. And I said, I don't understand why I have to have a penis to hold a plate under someone's mouth during communion. <laughs> and they didn't, like that question or that answer. So uh, I was constantly in trouble with the nuns, but I was, I was kind of an upstart. So um, kind of forced into Catholicism, questioned it the entire way. And when my mother passed away, when I was 18, there also left my experience with the Catholic church. Uh, she was sick for a very long time. And even though she couldn't go with me, it was still my job to go. And she would occasionally ask me like, what was the sermon about? And, you know, and I would I wasn't always going. I'd sit in a parking lot. I'd go to a park. I, I got, I did everything I could to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's how I was raised. My mother expected the good Catholic girl and my dad expected the tomboy. So we had a little, little conflict there. Little dichotomy going there. Okay. So your personality is one that, that question you, you had a critical mind, which of course mm -hmm. religion doesn't really it's not a big fan of critical mind because then you start asking questions and yeah. the whole thing might crumble and it might fall apart because then you start getting logical and oh, that's like oh. yeah for me the big i was raised in a religious home too so for me the big one was if god is unconditional love why is he also this judge just didn't really make sense to me it's like yeah. unconditional love so it's it's kind of like it's unconditional love However, if you don't believe in me, then I'm going to damn you to hell. That's like, right. hmm. And but I've had, yeah. And even in high school, I mean, I remember working one of my jobs between high school and college was I worked at Domino's Pizza and there was a gentleman there. Everybody was so great. I love, it was actually one of my favorite jobs, which is kind of silly. Uh, but there was a gentleman there who was born again Christian, really incredible guy, loved him to death. Mm -hmm. But he and I would have these conversations back and forth where I, I had read the Bible a couple of times because also I'm a curious person. I've read multiple religious texts just mm -hmm. because I want to, I just want to know. I'm just curious about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so he and I would kind of go back throwing Bible verses at each other and sort right. of having this like battle of the verses. Right. Um, and I remember like reading specifically to find things to debunk what he was, what he was saying, because you can interpret mm -hmm. things in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was a little bit of a smart ass with that, but yeah, I, I made him think. And he actually appreciated that. He's like, you know, I love our conversations because it makes me question things too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand this blind belief of things. To me, it's, it's about asking questions and exploring mm -hmm. um, and exploring things. And if you want, I can tell you the final straw that, that made me leave the Catholic church. Please. If you want to. Please. So I was very active in catechism because I figured, okay, if I have to be here, I'm going to run it because that's just my personality, very Capricorn. Um, yeah. And so like I ran the blood drive and I ran the car wash and I was the head of the dance committee. And, you know, if there was something that needed to be done, I did it because to me that made it more worthwhile. If I have to be here, I might as well be productive. And so everybody in the church knew me. Uh, I, you know, I was constantly in the bulletin about running the car wash and, you know, I was, I was, I was, figure in this in this congregation in this church mm -hmm. and after my mother passed away uh, i stopped i stopped going and i remember probably about two months after she died um i got a letter addressed to me from the church and my first thought was oh wow they want to check in and make sure i'm okay like i'm 18 years old i just lost my mom she's been sick for nine years they knew they always prayed for her and did that mm -hmm. whole thing oh my gosh, they're wondering like, if I'm okay, they're reaching out. This is actually so cool. And there was this brief moment where I thought, maybe they're not that bad. And mm -hmm. so I opened the letter and it says, dear Kathy, we've noticed in the last few months. And I'm like, oh my God, they see I've not been coming to church. Like they've noticed that I'm not there and they're reaching out to see what has happened. Mm -hmm. And then the letter went on to say that your donations have not been up to the amount that they had been in last year. What's going on? Uh they weren't checking in on me. They were checking in on my donation status. Wow. And I was furious. And yeah. that was the final straw for me. I'm like, seriously, this 18 year old <laughs> is suffering from losing her parent after eight or nine years of horrible cancer. And you're mm -hmm. wondering where your money is. And yeah. so I actually wrote them back. Now, I honestly don't remember if I ever sent the letter. It might've been one of those dumps that you don't actually mail. But, <laughs> but I remember thinking you guys had the, the most incredible opportunity to actually be compassionate, to be Christ-like yeah. and healing and nurturing as a parent figure. And they yeah. blew it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and not to say that all Catholic churches are bad. No, no. But, 
that was my experience with that one, which I had had such a huge connection to. So it was, it was yeah. a massive disappointment. Yeah. And I want to put the disc disclaimer out there that this is in no way against um, Christianity yeah, or anything like nope. that. This is just your personal experience. And absolutely. we all have unique experiences. There's many wonderful churches out there that would have reached out <laughs> and said, are you okay? And they wouldn't have mm -hmm. cared so much with a donation, I'm sure. And lots of wonderful Christian people. And Absolutely. I guess the way I look at it is it's a stepping stone. Well, that's been my experience. It's like religion was a wonderful thing for me because it was a stepping stone into spirituality. Yeah. Which, <laughs> so if I wouldn't have had that, it was a great catalyst for my spiritual growth. But I didn't want to stay there, of course. Right. So my concept of God has somewhat evolved instead of a, a I used to think God was like a, a white man with a long beard in the sky, something external. Now I believe God is inside me, which is, yep. and which has been very freeing. It's been yeah. wonderful, but not everybody's ready to go there. And I understand mm -hmm. that. And, and yeah. I, at one point I wasn't either. Okay. So let's continue with that. So, so after that, you decided to leave that church and what, did you just go headlong into partying and debauchery and fun or did you go did you gradually get into spirituality like what was your journey so i went to the complete opposite extreme and i discovered wicca oh okay. um i thought i was fascinated with the occult even when i was a little kid mm -hmm. uh you know i would sneak books out of the library on like tarot card reading and ghosts and mm -hmm. uh photography and magic and spells and i was just fascinated with it i'm sorry that harry potter didn't exist because i i'm, I'm a huge fan now but it's like that probably would have shaped my childhood oh, okay. um this idea of the unknown and of this personal power right so i right. went to that end of it mm -hmm. and and actually met people of a like mind when I was in college. I was a theater major and we tend to have these sort of magical ideas anyway uh, mm -hmm. and connected with a bunch of people that felt the same way I did. And we would read and we would joke around about stuff and we would play around with you know ceremonies and, and celebrations. Um, mm -hmm. And that continued into my life in California. And, and, and I sort of had the same discovery you did because you know I don't know how much you know about Wicca, but it, it's Just this a little sort bit of, here and there. Yeah, it's this this concept of goddess and God. And okay. that to me was one of the big things that was missing in Catholicism. Yes, you had Mother Mary, but she was not equal with God. Mm. Um, so I started to run into people that would say things like Mother, Father, God. And I went, oh, wow, the female. Let's welcome in the female. Mm. So I think that's why I swung to that opposite extreme. And in, in so many Wiccan traditions, it's all about the goddess. It's all about the female. And they completely disregard the God aspect of it. Um, not, not all, you know, Wiccans believe that, but it, it tends to be more female focused. And so mm -hmm. I think that was so refreshing for me to go, oh, wow, I, I can have power. Like the high priestess runs the show and the high priest supports her, um, having come from a place where I couldn't even be an altar boy, you know, so, right. um, so I you felt it was, you felt it was more empowering for females. Yes. And it was nature-based, right? Because it never made sense to me that, okay, so church is supposed to be Sunday, but Saturday night counts. Well, does Tuesday night count? No. Okay, well, then how does Saturday night count? Why can't I just like worship when and where I want to? And that was one of those questions that no one had a good answer for me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact that this was a nature-based thing about the, the harvest and the seasons of the year and the solstices and the equinox and the celebration of harvest mm -hmm. and this very human power and this human connection to earth really appear appealed to me um and so i kind of went that direction for the longest time mm -hmm. and that opened me up to this concept of personal spirituality because wicca is a religion but there's mm. not one leader there's not one well there's the only rule is end it harm none do what that will so basically mm. as long as you're not hurting anybody just be you like do you so you're <laughs> you know? allowed and to be yourself you're allowed to be yourself. And that was very appealing too, which leads me to what you said was you discovered that the, the God was inside you. Mm. And that's kind of what Wicca did for me. So you pick your sort of token deities, right? Maybe it's Diana and Pan. Maybe it's, you know, you're supposed to pick whatever God and goddess resonates with you. And I began to realize that we have all these pantheons from Greek and Roman and Norse. Mm. And I don't think they're real someplace, mm. but what that does is it taps into different aspects of you. 
So if right. I want to tap into this powerful wife, then I look at Hera. And if I want to, you know, tap into this beauty and this femininity, then it's it's you know Athena or, or war. Or what you know, I'm getting all my gods and goddesses mixed up. But it's like <laughs> to me, it was this representation of different aspects of self that we can bring out in any given situation. And I mm -hmm. found that so empowering to realize that I wasn't praying to some thing outside of me. Mm. I was activating different powerful parts of myself. And that was a huge shift for me in the way I thought about religion and spirituality. So that, that took me all through my life into California before I let the officialness of that fade. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I still have a little bit of those beliefs uh, mm -hmm. just from like nature and moon and, mm -hmm. and my own personal power, but I, I don't think I'd consider myself Wicca anymore. <laughs> right. Right. But, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I've seen a lot of interviews with people that were yeah, of the same persuasion as you, they got into Wicca, but it was sort of like a phase for them. And then eventually they, they moved into just the idea that God is in everything and everyone. Well, I guess that's kind of what it's basically saying, but they just sort of yeah. dropped the Wicca, the religion part right. of it. But it was like, a, how do you say a phase kind of like, kind of like religion was a phase for me. And you're kind of like moving forward. And it sounds like these gods and goddesses are all aspects of the one God. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's what I, I believe the Pantheon, you know, that's what it is. You had sort of one governing body and all of these, you know, spirit kind of as a general thing. And then all mm -hmm. these different aspects beneath that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what it felt like to me is, oh, I'm just activating different aspects. I don't know that I'd call it a phase because to me in my own brain, when I hear, oh, that's just a phase, it sounds like this mm -hmm. childhood thing that you're going to outgrow. And mm -hmm. I don't know that I outgrew Wicca. I mm -hmm. think I made it my own. I incorporated it into just sort of my perspective. Oh. And then once I started studying mind-body medicine and learning from people like Louise Hay and mm. Eckhart Tolle, who I'm a mm. huge fan of, Eckhart Tolle is, is a huge figure that has shaped what I do. And, you know, the, uh, the Carolyn Maces of the world and talking about sort of this modern view of myth and this modern view of God. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's shifted, that deepened everything even more. And I started to really work on this, this concept of self-actualization and studying at places like Lake Shrine and, you know, uh, self-realization fellowship and doing courses with Eckhart Tolle and mm. studying stuff with Carolyn Mace and Louise Hay. I think that was the next shift for me was going from Catholicism to Wicca to that self-actualization part of it. Well, it's all good. It's all God, right? It's all one. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's funny how religions can often be divisive and they say, you know, our way is the only way and everything else is of the devil. So, uh, I remember when I went to church as a young person, um, there was a, what do they call it in the eighties? They called it satanic panic or something. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're aware of that. You're probably aware of it. And I know that they kept saying that Wicca was satanic and sure. all this, but you don't, w Wiccans don't worship the devil. No, that's, that's completely, well, they also said Dungeons and Dragons was satanic and that all the rock music satanic and the movies were satanic. I mean, it was, yeah. it, it's my, my, my boyfriend and I were huge fans of um, Stranger Things. Oh yeah. And yeah. We also blo both played Dungeons and Dragons and it's hilarious because we're watching this and uh, he, he's younger than me. So at one point he turned to me, he goes, did this actually happen in the 80s? Like, were they seriously saying Dungeons and Dragons was evil? I'm like, yep. <laughs> Everything at that point was evil to them. So no, right. Wicca, it, it's not at all evil. But I think yeah. the two misconceptions were the pentagram is a big fi big figure in a big symbol in Wicca. And there's, you know, if you look back to Greek and Roman mythology, even Norse, there's horned gods. Mm -hmm. Pan and, you know, th they have the horns. So you see mm -hmm. a horned god and you see a pentagram and you go, it's the devil. It's not. <laughs> That's know? not what it was. Uh, you, know, you can blame Anton LaVey for starting the church of, you know, uh, the church, church of Satan, well, but. You know, that's not Wicca. That's that's a completely different. Thing. Okay, so that's the upside. So the Anton LaVey, that would be the upside down pentagram. Yeah. In other words, inverting. Yeah. And power and, is inverted. But what you're talking about is the uh, uh, the right side. Yeah. Uh, how would you say that the upside pentagram? Uh, so one point up. So what that that what, what that represents, and if you look at you know satanic worship or any of that stuff, they reversed everything. It was an upside pentacle. It was an upside mm. cross. Upside down cross. They did that for and yet for and yet they're using things. the same power, right? Well, mm -hmm. and the 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 symbol of a pentagram that was around right. in Christianity long right. before the pagans took it. It was an outstretched human figure. Oh, it's the four elements with spirit on top. Okay. 
So it's earth, air, fire, water. And that top point is spirit. It's mm-hmm. that guiding force. And what Anton LaVey did is he flipped it. So that the physical desires trumped spirit. Okay. That's what he was going for was that chaotic, that chaotic matter. So the lower chakras. So Anton LaVey uh, honors the root, the... the uh, it's se- not a chakra-based thing. It was the mm. uh, more an elemental thing of oh, the, okay. the, the elements of, you know, earth, air, fire, water, mm. putting spirit above that. He flipped it so that all of the other elements were above spirit. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so a big difference between these two. Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. They're completely the opposites. Huh? Completely the opposite, right. Yeah. Well, so, again, the only the only role of Wicca is and it harm none, do what you will. So right. the very the first and only rule is don't hurt anybody. And that is certainly not what people who, you know, have negativity or dark magic or dark anything. You right. know, yeah. uh, it doesn't even have to be religion at this point. We have a lot of people hurting each other using negativity and fear and power and words. And yeah. uh, that's to me more evil than what Anton LaVey was doing. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. So um so that's your opinion. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So um, yeah, now, yeah, I guess I didn't mean to say phase, but I'm kind of like trying to, the, I don't know what the, I'm trying to find a word for you evolved and like you oh, brought transition. Yeah. Transition. There, there's but about. I think it was just, that was just the way I, the, that's just the, what the word does to me. It's a perfectly fine word. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, I think it was a transition time. I think I, the pendulum, as so often it does, right, has to swing the opposite direction. Ah, so Hermes. I found some, Hermes. I fa- yeah, I found something that was so diametrically opposed to Catholicism, and it just spoke to me in that time. Yeah. It was what I was, and, and this, you know, tarot cards and, you mm-hmm. know, all that kind of stuff, just, it appealed to me in some way. Sure. Um, and that just led to me uncovering all this other stuff, like Eckhart Tolle and, you know, mm. all these other beliefs, Dalai Lama, you know, all these, mm. live your best life, love yourself, love others, don't be a jerk, is sort of the only rules we need, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how I live my life. It's like, am I coming from love or am I coming from fear? Okay, as long as I come from love, right. that, that's my only rule that yeah. I have for myself is like, every action I do, is it coming from love or is it coming from fear? Whenever I have done something coming from fear, it always messed things up. So I'm like, hmm, okay, that's right. interesting. And uh, love Eckhart Tolle, love, love, love the book Power of Now. Yes. I read that back in the day, I think quite a bit of it, yeah. some of it anyway. And, uh, that was, um, that was a real catalyst for me. So yeah. I, I, I also resonate very much with that, uh, especially the idea of being the observer and just, oh. uh, uh, noticing the, you know, the, the birds chirping, the, the, the trees without labeling, like I'll go for a walk yeah. in the woods. And I find that to be very calming. Yeah. So it's uh, great. Okay, so let's move on. So when you, um, so you said you brought some of those ideas with you, but then when did you get into Eckhart Tolle and all of that sort of thing? Was that in your early 20s or? Probably mid 20s. It was a while ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I started out as, well, I started out as an actor, um, oh. but I had this parallel path running of massage and healing as well. So mm-hmm. I was exposed to a lot of like Louise Hay mm-hmm. and Carolyn Mace, the, this concept of mind body, which is, I think, probably how I found Eckhart Tolle. I was mm-hmm. on this spiritual quest of like, I wanted to learn everything about everything. I still feel that way. <laughs> I, you know, if I, I'm a lifelong learner. I will never stop learning. Nice. Um, so any book I picked up and the neat thing was as a slight off you know, side, side note, as I'm massaging clients, people talk, right? And so I got to meet um, Buddhists and I got to meet born again Christians and Pentecostal Christians and Jehovah's Witness mm. and Mormons and Scientologists. And, you know, I got to meet all of these people Great. and I would ask questions. You know, I would, I, I massage an ex nun for the longest time. I had so many questions for, I massage an ex priest, mm-hmm. um, rabbis. And, you know, it was fascinating to me to have these conversations and understand what makes people tick and what makes people believe what they do mm-hmm. and how that has evolved and trans transitioned throughout their lives. So I loved having those conversations and it just sparked my wanting to know even more, um, and so probably it was probably in my mid twenties that I that I discovered it was definitely because I went to Lake Shrine for the first time when I was like twenty three or twenty four, um, and walked around there and just like did kind of feel this serenity there. And so studied that for a while. Where and, was this? Where was this? Uh, Lake Shrine in Los Angeles. So it's oh. right where uh, Sunset Boulevard hits um, the beach, basically. Okay. And it's Paramahansa Yogananda's place. 
he's of course since passed on but oh, yeah. um there's a temple there and they do church services which i think i've been to maybe two or three times but it's this beautiful lake and you walk around it and there's gardens and there's different places to worship and different places to meditate and it welcomes all faiths and they have a rose garden where they have representations of like six or seven different types of religion mm -hmm. um and it's such a beautiful place and it's where so many people come together just to be just to be together and I've done a couple silent retreats there, which was amazing. And I went through their like mail, mail order class program. That's the self-reading thing. And it was, it was a beautiful program, specifically talking about self-actualization and, and um, self-realization. Nice. So that was probably one of, the, one of the first things I found. And then it, it kind of developed into that. And have you ever, there. so these silent retreats, have you ever been on one of these silent retreats where you have to stay silent for hours on end or days? Oh, on... yeah, it was a three-day thing. Three days, three days of total silence. Yeah nice and it was it wasn't as hard everyone's like, oh that'd be so hard well it's not like you're walking around your daily life where everybody else is talking and you're trying to be silent mm. everybody's silent yeah um and it was so funny because i think on my third second or third one you could see who the first timers were because <laughs> they were so like they're setting things down quietly and they're moving slowly and it's like it's not a you're not miming you're just just do the thing you know mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, it was a phenomenal experience sitting in silence for three days and meditating with monks was, it was an awesome experience. What was the biggest thing that you feel that you learned from that experience of the three days in silence? The trappings of being human sort of fell away. So like we're all sitting eating together, right? And we're just, no one's talking. And I was thinking at the end of the retreat, when we were allowed to talk again, everybody was kind of like, oh. Oh God, it was, you know, and all these words came pouring out and you learned people had accents and like people were from other countries and you got to hear what people did. And we didn't know any of that. You didn't know if you were sitting across from the producer for, you know, Disney, or if you were sitting across from a millionaire, or if you're sitting across from a homeless guy or a mom or a, you know, you didn't know who these people were. You just knew you were all there for the same purpose which was to meditate and be present. And there was sort of something liberating about that, <laughs> you know, to not have to put on, well, what do you do? Mm -hmm. uh, and like go into this like small talk, mm -hmm. which I love doing. I'll talk to anybody anywhere. Mm -hmm. So being that I'm such an extrovert, it was interesting to see how that translated into three days of being with the same group of people where you didn't know anything about any of them, except that you were all there theoretically for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. So I, I highly recommend it. It was a really cool experience. Unfortunately, because of COVID, they stopped doing the retreats and mm -hmm. I sort of fell out of their classes anyway. So mm -hmm. I don't even know that I'd remember how to meditate and, and do the stuff that they do because mm -hmm. it's been a couple of years, but it was a yeah. beautiful experience. That sounds amazing. Yeah. 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 And I like the fact that you, that you found that uh, you, you didn't have that, um, the trappings, the, uh, I am a millionaire or I'm a homeless person because we are none of these things anyway. I mean, right. these are just labels that, that aren't, that they don't reflect the true essence of the, the yeah. God within. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, and that's what Eckhart Tolle talks about, right? It's about mm. this identification with form. It's mm. the I'm a this, I'm a that. And mm. we put these labels on, mm -hmm. but then when those labels disappear, who are we? Free. Right. right. <laughs> it's hard to do that. You know, I have so many clients who are parents, specifically mm. moms. And mm. once their last kid moves out of the house, they're lost because mm. their identity was I'm a mom yes. and they have no clue what to do with themselves when the kid moves out. And then they still try to mom. So they're helicopter parenting or stepping in where they shouldn't, or, you know, doing yeah. things like that. And, um, it's that's that labeling it's that identification with form and we struggle with that right because we're in a society where that's the questions we ask Absolutely. You know, what do you do how do you meet so and so you know that's how we connect with other people is through those labels mm -hmm. so if we drop those labels in some ways it's harder to make those connections because then what do you talk about <laughs> yeah so it makes sense that you're sitting in silence you, you don't have anything to talk about anyway <laughs> so that's wow okay so so uh, let's go to, let's pick it up from there. So after you were at the silent retreat, um, did anything unfold for you on your spiritual path? That was another catalyst. Yeah, I think the next sort of like demarcation, the silent retreats were more recent. So we're going to oh. actually back up in time. Oh, I, okay. I went to Lake Shrine and did uh, some of their programs, but the silent retreats were probably in the last six years. Mm -hmm. um that i finally i'm in santa barbara now i was in la then um mm -hmm. the next thing that sort of became a spiritual awakening for me was learning reiki mm -hmm. 
which mm -hmm. is a hands-on healing technique. Mm -hmm. So it's um, a great addition to massage. It's not actually a massage. You either put your hands above the person or just lay them, put the hands on. There's debates about what is actually happening. Some people say nothing's happening, <laughs> which, yep, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen incredible changes in the people that I do Reiki on. Mm -hmm. But when I met my Reiki instructor, uh, there's three levels of Reiki. There's one, two, and then master level. Master level doesn't mean you're better than anybody else that does it. It just means that you studied more and you have the ability to teach other people to do Reiki. Mm. So when I found that, uh, I did level one and then I screwed it up and I had to do level one again because mm -hmm. I got a little too, a little too party mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of lost it. I, I wasn't treating myself well and I lost it. And mm. um, then I did level two, which was amazing. And when I finished that, she said, Kathy, I don't ask this of everyone, but would you want to do the master level so that you could teach other people? I'm getting just this clear message that, that you should do that. And okay. I thought about it and I called her and I said, yeah, I'd, I'd actually really like to do that. And she said, I'm going to warn you. I went, uh, okay. She said, it's going to change your life. Wow. And, I went, and I was like 20, 27 or 28. And I went, okay. She goes, I'm, I'm really being serious. This is not to be taken lightly. I want you to consider if you actually want to do this, because once you take the step, everything in your life is going to change. And I went, yeah, okay. She goes, seriously, take a week. Went, All right. So I didn't really think about it. Cause I'm like, what do you mean? My life is going to change, whatever. And so I met her a week later and she said, are you ready to do this? And I said, yes. And I got my Reiki master attunement. And about two weeks later, I realized I had to absolutely leave the relationship I was in. <laughs> I was oh, miserable. Okay. I, changed my, I moved, I, I left my relationship and I sort of changed career paths. And like, she was totally on everything in my life shifted because mm. I almost had this kind of spiritual responsibility of helping other people go through healing processes. Mm -hmm. And I think that really did affect me. Now, maybe that was programmed because she told me that my life would change. Um, maybe it was time anyway, maybe had I not done the Reiki, it still would have happened. I don't know, but I did feel a shift in me of, I need to be taking care of me and I need to be doing what's right for me. Hmm. And I need to get rid of the things around me that are not good. And one of those was the relationship I was in. So sure. it was a huge life shift after I, after I learned how to do Reiki. Well, it sounds to me that your, your vibration changed so much that there was a real discord between the vibration that your part, your then partner was at mm -hmm. and the one that you were at. So like a real, you know, yep. divergence. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. So, so the whole thing with Reiki was a major catalyst for you. Yeah. Yeah, service service like, to I've others never, service I've to others i've never thought about this in a timeline so talking to you about this it's like oh yeah i can see these like very clear sort of demarcations mm. of of shifts so it's kind of kind of interesting it's like the wayne dyer book i can see clearly now because <laughs> that's what he does right i don't know if you read that book but that's what I he did. does yeah he uh it's just before he shortly before he passed away mm. which makes sense right i guess his mission was done yeah, yeah. He did a lot. <laughs> He's one of my uh, favorite uh, self-help authors, him and Eckhart Tolle. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, in his book, I can see clearly now all the things that at the time did not make sense or felt, they felt tragic or whatever. At the end, when he looked back over, he's like, oh my God, it's like a beautiful tapestry uh -huh. of his life like everything was meant to be and it was all perfect as it was yep. i just love this idea that there are no real like people beat themselves up i have clients that say to me because i do emotion code i'm an emotion code practitioner and i do cord pulling as well and when i do these um with clients though sometimes they'll say to me well i did this and i feel so bad i'm like stop everything's perfect there are no mistakes. Yeah. You did the best you could. You, we're always doing the best we can at every moment. I mean, yep. our ego wants to think that we're actually in control of life. It wants to take credit. The thing is life or God or whatever you want to call it, that's what's in control. And if you surrender to that, there's no, you know, let the divine lead. I find that my life unfolds a lot more smoothly uh, yep. Then when I try to take credit and try to control and manipulate and that never works out, it never works out. No, it's going to so, unfold the way it's supposed to. And exactly. it's, you know, the, the things that I thought were so horrible, 
<laughs> I look back now and I see it was this beautiful transition to something different. And it worked out exactly what it was supposed to. The role in the play I didn't get, the movie role I didn't get, the mm. job that that dumped me, the boy that dumped me, mm. or whatever didn't go out with me in the first place. You know, all those mm. things that I thought were horrible ended up being an absolute gift and led me to something different not even something better, just something different. And that's led me to this place in my life, which is pretty damn awesome. Um, nice. Amazing life. And I know it's, it's, a, it's a conglomeration of all of those things that happened to me throughout mm. my life that have mm. led me to right at this moment. I love I'm it. not done. I got so much. Of work. course. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's fascinating to kind of look back and chart all this stuff and go, oh, that happened. Oh, that changed that. Yeah. And that you know. From yeah. the silliest choices we make that seem silly to, you know, huge choices to outside people's choices, you know, yeah. all offense us. And I think this is really pertinent for people in our audience. If you're going through a struggle right now, just remember life is, it doesn't always feel like it in the moment, but life is truly a gift and everything that's unfolding for you is perfect just as it is. On yeah. the surface, it don't look that way, but someday, mark my words, you'll look back and you'll be like, oh my God, I'm so grateful that this happen because sometimes yeah. something for example someone loses their job but then they want it opens a door for something even better but yep. they might be so attached to that job in that moment they're like oh my god oh, what am i going to do it's it's all about letting go releasing control uh -huh. and trusting that the universe has got your back yeah. i mean you are the universe why would you want to hurt yourself right <laughs> absolutely like, yeah so i'm not you know i think all of the um the uh when things go wrong it's more like when we're in a state of resistance to what is and when you let go and let god as some people say then mm -hmm. life can flow and um yeah so i really love your story that's going to be inspiring for so many people okay so so these silent retreats you've done more in the last six years you said yeah. okay it sounds like those have been real catalysts, so. Those you. were great, you know, and it's like, I really dove in in probably the last five or six years, I've really, really dove into Eckhart Tolle. I had listened to Power of Now years ago, uh, and I had all his books, mm -hmm. but I, I was, I'm a subscriber to his newsletter and his little videos that come out, and he was doing a um, six-month intensive, mm. and I see those come through all the time, you know, study with so-and-so. Um, but this one, for some reason, I was like, let me open this up. And I clicked on it. And the first weekend in person was up at a Silomar, which is in Monterey, which is like, I don't know, four and a half, five hour drive for me. And I was like, oh my God, I love a Silomar. It's one of my favorite places. <laughs> and the closing weekend was in Santa Barbara, right down the street from me. Oh, there you go. And I said, look, I can't, I can't, this is, the, I can't turn this down. It's too perfect. I can't turn this down. It was too perfect. Mm -hmm. And it was a six month program and there was live interactive stuff as well as recordings and notebooks. And, you know, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a hearty program. Um, and that was also a huge catalyst for me because when I signed up for the program, uh, it started about four months after I left my husband. Okay. Of like a very long time. Mm -hmm. So it was the perfect transition from, that loss into going into this very intensive program with Eckhart Tolle talking about being and, you know, reality and resistance and, and mm. being the observer. And it's funny, I have all these post-it notes of quotes that I read from books and stuff. And yeah. the one I just looked at is unhappiness is when we're confusing what is happening in your mind with what re reality is, you know, so much of it is right. up here, right? It's our thoughts about that thing. It's not oh. the thing. Um, so yeah, doing that program with Eckhart Tolle could not have come at a better time for me. So it was a pivotal time in my life. Fantastic. And what was he like? So you got to interact one-on-one? -on -one? We were in a big group. Uh, I think at one point, you know, we were able to walk by and say hi. There was no like actual one-on-one -on -one time. We were in a really large auditorium. Okay. Um, it was interesting. I thought it would be um, like more powerful to be with him in person somehow. Mm -hmm. But I have to say his presence is so incredible that even watching his videos to me, watching him on video didn't feel any less powerful than being with him in person. Hmm. Nice. It was kind of interesting, uh, but it yeah. was, there was that sort of titillation of you in person. He's yeah, yeah. And, you know, starstruck. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hearing him, not even so much starstruck, but just in awe of, oh my God, I'm sitting here with that cartel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was really fun. And, you know, Kim did some movement stuff and she answered some questions too. And it's his, his I guess, partner, but he, she does a lot of his teaching with him. Oh yeah, Kim. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of fun. And, uh, 
yeah, I kept in touch with some of the people I met there and it was a really life-changing experience. It, it really upped my um, desire to be more present mm -hmm. and to study more of his stuff. I just started reading New Earth again after not having picked it up probably since it came out. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, is it prevalent. It's really important now. If, if, yeah, yeah, it's good. always important, but it's really important right now. Good time to read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, well, he's actually from this, uh, my neck of the woods, right? He's from Vancouver or yeah. that's where he presently lives, I believe. Um, yeah. I'm in Kelowna, Yeah, I think he's originally from Ger Germany. I think so. Austria, yeah. Something like that. But yeah, yeah he was yeah, in yeah. Vancouver. Germany, I time. think. Yeah, he, yeah. I think I believe he's German. Yeah. Yeah. I've been following him for eons. Uh, really, really love him. And uh, just, just a, a very humble soul. I don't really detect a whole lot of ego going on there. Nope. And one of the, <laughs> one of the great things is, you know, people want to call him a spiritual leader. People want to call him a guru. People want to follow him from, you know, I, there, I bumped into people there that had seen him 20 or 30 times. They just follow him from city to city. Mm. And there's a part of me that goes, uh, there is such a, you know, there are people who are addicted to self-help. Yes. And there are people who just, you know, go from guru to guru, yeah. leader to leader. And they don't yeah. ever change themselves. They just want to be in that environment. Yeah. Um, not to say that everybody does that, but I, I've met a lot of those. Um, and so he was even one to say, look, I'm not a spiritual leader. Like mm -hmm. I am no different than you. Mm -hmm. He said right now, because I'm teaching you, I'm a spiritual teacher. He said, but you know, the second I walk off the stage, what I'm not is a spiritual teacher. Right. I'm just a guy who's going to get in my car and go back to my hotel room. And it was that whole idea of identification, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not a massage therapist right now because I'm not massaging anybody. I'm not a life coach right now because I'm not coaching anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm just a person sitting here having a conversation with yeah. you. And okay. I think we forget that. And we get so, again, wrapped up in these identities of, well, who do I have to be? Mm -hmm. And it's like, just you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do because we're in these yeah. stupid, you know, these bodies, these meat suits that are so <laughs> confusing and they're they're dirty and they make noises. and But they know, provide we, an amazing catalyst don't ah, they for our expansion that's it's a thing. great vehicle it's it great is vehicle. it yeah. is it is indeed i get what you're saying though because i think that there is such a thing i know this sounds like an oxymoron but i think there's such a thing as spiritual ego yeah. so that's where the ego is claiming i'm a spiritual person this is my identity but that's just another trap of the ego yeah that's, and and that tends to be human nature to get to go outside of ourselves for a savior and it kind of reminds me people getting addicted to self-help and following mm -hmm. from city to city. It's kind of like rock, rock groups, right? Yeah. And this, I feel, this is just a discernment I have, no judgment on anybody because everybody's perfect as they are. Uh, it's a discernment that it's a spiritual ego. Yeah. And it's well, harder to embody. Like you said, I really hope these people are then embodying <laughs> yeah their, their their spirituality but instead they may be just projecting 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 and, and it's good to be interdependent i think on we need mm -hmm. each other at the same time we have to be independent as well and like take it on ourselves like we are our own savior right right uh, um, absolutely and i think i think it's sort of spiritual shopping um <laughs> i think they go from self-help to self-help to self-help looking for this external thing mm. that's going to explain it all. And at some point you do have to realize you're the thing. Yes. You just, you know, you're the thing. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and you can keep asking people's opinion. It's like people who doctor shop, you know, they'll go to 30 surgeons and then 29 will say, you're going to have to get a knee replacement. And the one will go, well, I don't know, maybe we could put magnets on it. Great. This is the guy that's right. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, they look around and magnets are great, but yeah. you know, they look around until they find the thing that they want to hear. Yeah. Uh, I think that's can, can, can be the trap with this sort of, you know, self-help Yes. spiritual stuff too. You know, mm -hmm. I was recently in a, in a bookstore. We don't have a chain bookstore here in Santa Barbara. And so we were up in uh, San Luis Obispo, just walking around and there was a Borders or Bonja, no, whichever one it was. Mm -hmm. And we're looking around. I went up to the self-help section and it was like, I couldn't even see the end of it. It was so vast of books that would help you figure out everything. Mm -hmm. And I used to see people kind of going this one and this one and this one, you know, and they take 30 of these self-help books. Mm -hmm. One, do you ever finish them? Two, do you actually put into practice those things suggest what those books suggest? And I think that's sort of the, you know, mm -hmm. full circle of what we're talking about is, yeah. are you taking the information you are gaining 
Yeah. And are you actually doing something with it? Are you actually living those lessons that you're being taught? Or yeah. are you just reading about this outside thing and not actually creating change in you? Yeah. Are you living a godlike life? Are you loving people? Are you being compassionate? Are you mm -hmm. being responsive and not reactive? Are you being mm -hmm. present? Mm -hmm. And I have seen so many people recently just presence seems to have gone out the window to the oh. point where they're not even looking when they cross the street. Oh, they wow. just walk in front of cars and hope the cars stop. And it's like, well, you better hope the driver's being present uh -huh. and aware of what's happening. So I, I don't know if it's what's happening globally or what's happening just in the States politically or. That's I, bizarre. I'm seeing this lack of presence and this lack of just common consideration. People saying thank you and please. And, you know, mm. Eckhart Tolle loves to talk about just moments of presence, right? And when he does his yes. gazing, which is one of my favorite, I love gazing, it's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about, you know, you, you're at Starbucks or your local coffee shop and they hand you your change and you go, thank you. And you put it in your thing and you grab your coffee and you go. Right. And it becomes this very transactional exchange with this person who's serving you. Mm. And how much time does it take to meet their eyes for a second, take the change and go, thank you. Yeah. Just that moment of presence. And I try so hard to do that. I'm not successful. I'm at like 90% of when I, <laughs> talk, I I try to meet their eyes and just mm. take that moment of presence mm. because then that moment of presence turns into a cascade of moments of presence. Yeah. Of us being just with that other human being for just that moment before you take your change and you move on to the next thing. Yeah. Can you find the being in the doing is what he says all the time. Yeah, like it's like a namaste, which which means I honor the God within you and the God within me and the God within you are both one, right? So yeah. it's like a, it's like a treasure really to yeah. look into someone's eyes and say thank you or um, some what I like to do. I'm really lucky here is that I have this beautiful forested area near my mm. near the place where I live, and I get to I don't. I don't get to, you know, with everything that's gone on in the last two years, I, ha I have to be honest, I haven't gone out and socialized with friends as much and so on. But what I do appreciate is that those little moments of connection I get when I meet people on the nature path Yeah. and we connect and people are so nice. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, Canadians, you know, we're a nice you have a reputation anyway. for being nice. Yeah, <laughs> not, not that Americans are not, but, you know, Canadians are just so sometimes overly polite i don't know but um but no this is real genuine connection i feel with mm -hmm. these and it's really nice and it just makes me realize there's so many more uh, loving hearts in the world than there yeah. are of the evil kind and of course the evil kind they're doing their best as well and one day they'll get there they'll get to the love it might take several lifetimes <laughs> yeah. i don't know but uh when they're ready uh nobody can escape source eventually we're all going back to the same place uh -huh. and it don't matter how many misdeeds or wrongs or no because it's unconditional love is what's waiting yeah. um i've i've had the pleasure of of, of interviewing some near-death experience people oh nice and they all say the same um, for the most part they all say the same thing um it's just love on the other side and love is the only thing that's real and yeah all this hatred and everything that's all an illusion anyway you know it's like i mean it is it feels real <laughs> because that's the game right yeah. it has to feel real for the catalyst yeah. but on well, the other it's, it's when we identify with those things and we have to defend them right it becomes yeah. us versus them yeah and i did actually my second tedx talk was on us versus them because i was writing mm. a book at the time which mm -hmm. unfortunately ended up having to drop for various reasons but mm -hmm. you know i one of the first things i said during the talk was okay let's say we're going to play dodgeball and i'm going to divide you all up by everybody over 40 and everybody under 40 and so you go to your respective sides and you look at the other and you go they're the enemy we're going to beat them mm -hmm. and then i go oh wait 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 hang on actually why don't we do blue eyes versus brown eyes and you suddenly recognize that people were us a second ago or now them interesting and, or maybe we're gonna do men versus women and then we switch it again and you realize well they were us first now they're then now they're us you know it depends on what criteria you're using we're yeah. we all have stuff in common we all have more in common than we do not in common and Absolutely. unfortunately it's so embedded in us to look at the other as wrong, bad, scary. Um, and if we just took that second to find that 
sameness. And that's why I love the symbol of yin yang, because there's a piece of us in all of us. Mm. Right? There's a piece of each other in, in us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if we just shift our perspective and we come from this place of presence and love and connection, as opposed to making the other bad and having to defend our position to be right and prove mm-hmm. that we have an identity, mm-hmm. that everything's going to shift. Now, I wish it was as easy as that, right? It's, it's a process. Um, yeah, I hope is. we're moving that direction. I hope we're moving that direction. I hope so. I hope so. So um, I really enjoyed this uh, discussion we've had. Is there anything that you, if there was one last thing that you would like to share with the audience, what would it be? Like one inspirational message of Kathy Groover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it really just is being present. And, you know, talking to strangers to me is one of my favorite pieces of advice because you never know who you're going to meet and what wisdom you're going to get to impart on them or from them Mm. uh, just by having those connections Mm -hmm. and those really human to human connections are some of the most powerful things we can have. So, um, you know, put the self-help books down and start living it, go out and meet people and explore other things and just do, do your best to be as present as you can at all times. I love it. So you're talking about full embodiment. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Okay. Before we go, Kathy, I'd just like to give you a chance to where, uh, if someone wants to contact you about, for example, your services, you have some services that you offer. Yeah. What, what is the website that they can go to, to um, contact you? If yeah, they're interested? Ab- absolutely. So if anybody wants to do life coaching, I deal with a lot of people in transition of, you know, they just left their job. They're leaving a relationship. I do a lot of relationship coaching, which is one of my favorite things. And that is Kathy Groover.coach. Kathy with a K, Groover, G-R-U-V-E-R dot coach. I have a relationship reboot program, which is a 10-week program for couples, which is relationship reboot dot coach. Um, and my speaking site is just kathygroover.com. So beautiful, beautiful. And we will be putting underneath the little box <laughs> where you are. There we'll put the um, well, we'll put it in two places. We'll put it on the video so you can see Kathy's um, website underneath her. Uh, face here and we'll also put it in the on the youtube underneath the video the, okay. all the links are there so thank you so much kathy it's been a real pleasure having you on the show thanks for having me i appreciate it have a great one okay kathy thank you very much and that's that's it for another edition of soul inspire see you next time the soul inspire podcast is brought to you by dealcross.net Discover the freedom, bliss, and ecstasy within you. At dalecross.net, I can help connect you with your soul's purpose, passion, and mission. Your soul signed up for something great. Discover what it is with the tools I offer. Book a free one-on-one consultation now at dalecross.net and live your greatness.